today with the singing of hymn number 377, stanzas 1 through 5. <laughs>
beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. <coughs> our help is in the name of the Lord. Oh, man, heaven and earth. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And thou forgivest the iniquity of my sin. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess unto thee that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against thee by thought, word, and deed. Wherefore we flee for refuge to thine infinite mercy, seeking and imploring thy grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. O most, most merciful God, who has given thy only begotten Son to die for us, have mercy upon us, and for his sake grant us remission of all our sins, and by thy Holy Spirit increase in us true knowledge of thee, and of thy will, and true obedience to thy word, to the end that by thy grace we may come to everlasting life, through Jesus Christ our Lord.
verses 1 through 13. In those days, the multitude being very great, and having nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples unto him, and saith unto them, I have compassion on the multitude, because they have now been with me three days, and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away fasting to their own houses, they will faint by the way. For diverse of them came from far. And his disciples answered him, From whence can a man satisfy these men with bread here in the wilderness? And he asked them, How many loaves have you? And they said, Seven. And he commanded the people to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven loaves and gave thanks and break, and gave to his disciples to set before them. And they did set, before, set them before the people. And they had a few small fishes, and he blessed and commanded to set them also before them. So they did eat and were filled, and they took up of the broken meat that was left seven baskets. And they that had eaten were about four thousand, and he sent them away. And straightway he entered into a ship with his disciples, and came into the parts of Dalmanutha. And the Pharisees came forth and began to question with him, seeking of him a sign from heaven, tempting him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit, and said, Why doth this generation seek after a sign? Verily I say unto you, There shall no sign be given unto this generation. And he left them, and entering into the ship again, departed to the other side. Here endeth the Gospel lesson. Praise be to thee, O Christ. Let us confess our Christian faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. Who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost. The Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. We continue now with the singing of hymn 377, stanza 6 through 10. Oh, 
He looks for those Christians who are spiritually sick, weak in the faith, who separate themselves from the church, from the word of God, from the sacraments, and attacks them. Truly, his goal is to take down the whole herd, but he does it cunningly, one by one. Do not lay your armor down, but put it on piece by piece in prayer to God, and be prepared for the war. We can pretend there is no war, but Satan makes war against us whether we engage or not, as we hear. And the dragon was wroth with the woman, the church, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Thus today, in an effort to simplify, to encourage, to receive hope and comfort, and to prepare, we will see the truth of something wherein there is no confusion and no uncertainty, something cut and dry. That is the most basic of Christian truths, as told to us by our Savior himself when he said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Let us then see these things according to our text for today, which is found in the sixth chapter of Paul's epistle to the Romans, beginning at verse 19. Please rise for the reading of the text. Romans chapter 6, verses 19 through 23. I speak after the manner of men, because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, being made free from sin, and become servants to God, Ye have your fruit unto holiness, and the end, everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So far our text, let us pray. O Lord Jesus Christ, teach us the truth this day of unbelief and faith, that one leads only to death, and the other to life everlasting. We come before thee in the midst of confusing times, and we often feel, as did the disciples in the ship in the midst of the storm, frightened and hopeless, crying out unto thee, Carest thou not that we perish? Truly we know that thou dost indeed care, for thou didst come in the likeness of sinful flesh, and didst offer up thyself in our stead to pay for our sin. How then wilt thou leave us and forsake us? Truly thou art always with us, and carest deeply for us. Remind us of thy great love, and in the midst of this storm upon earth, earth, grant unto us those precious words, Peace, be still. Comfort us by the gospel of peace, wherein we are promised eternal life in heaven with thee, and teach us that as Paul, we should consider all things on earth as done, and that the true treasure is thy word and the salvation offered therein. Give us a strong faith which does not falter during tribulation, but continues to witness of thy grace toward sinful men, until we shall pass from this life and be brought to dwell with thee forevermore. Amen. You may be seated. Let us then, dear Christians, according to our text, Learn of the cut and dried truth that our shame is unto death. We read verses 19 through 21 and verse 23 of our text. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death, for the wages of sin is death. 
The words of Paul in our text are parallel to Jesus' words in the last chapter of Mark. Unbelief leads only to death, that is, to damnation. Paul does not beat around the bush here in his letter to the Romans, but makes it abundantly clear that the works of darkness or sin are the path to eternal damnation. He speaks of their sin as the things which now cause them shame. Can each of us, in this place, take the words of Paul as being spoken directly to us? Of course we can, because each and every one of us has sins which cause us great shame, especially after we have been shown the truth of those things. Paul himself can look into his own past and there see things that are a great shame to him. He was a persecutor and murderer of Christians, but now advocates for them and is one himself. It is almost a contradiction of the highest order, but as is the case with all Christians, they are Christians because they are sinners and need to be saved from their sin. That was the very purpose of the coming of Jesus Christ into the flesh. Paul shows the futility of sin when he directs the Romans to look for the fruit of those shameful deeds. Truly the end fruit is always death. As he says, the wages of sin is death. But even from an earthly perspective, men are not blessed by God when they are manifest and impenitent sinners. Rather, they are cursed by him. Paul says in another place, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. If a man sows to the lust of his flesh, he will reap precisely what he sows. Think for a moment just on one sin, in particular that of adultery. In the moment, there is little else that a man considers other than that moment of pleasure. But the, but the fallout from such a sin is greater than can possibly be fathomed. His wife loses trust. Their marriage is destroyed. Their children lose the benefit of a full-time mother and father. Both guilty parties have entered into manifest sin. Look at what this sin in particular has done to our society and the devastation it has wreaked on the family as created by God. The good of our sin and shame is found to be nothing. It is but dumb and worthy only to be cast out. Paul speaks of the exponential nature of sin when he says that we yielded our members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity. Paul says this because sin leads to further sin and it multiplies exceedingly. And when men yield to sin and shame, they are paving a way for sin to reign in their bodies unto everlasting destruction. James says, Every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then, when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Make no mistake, dear Christians, those who live in manifest and impenitent sin will not see the kingdom of God. They will be damned, that is, without God, forever. This is the truth, and applies unto all who have sinned, which is every person. And you might now say, Pastor, you said you would offer hope and comfort, but you have given only grief and sorrow over sin. And I say that up till now, that is true. But without first hearing of what one deserves, one cannot hear or receive comfort and hope. One must first recognize that he is sick before he will see the need for a physician. Each of us are terrible sinners, and each of us is full of shame at the things we have done. <coughs> However, that does not mean there is no hope. On the contrary, God offers abundant hope unto hopeless, lost, and shamed sinners. He does so by showing unto us the cut and dry truth that shame is unto death, but faith is unto life. We read verses 19 through 23 of our text. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members' servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, 
Even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin, and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness, and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. In sharp contrast to the wages of sin is the gift of God, which is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Because we have yielded our members as instruments of unrighteousness and have brought shame to ourselves, it becomes obvious that we can in no wise set ourselves free from this bondage. Notice how Paul calls eternal life a gift, and in contrast called death a wage. A wage is something earned, a gift is not. And so death is earned while life is given, and is not a work of man. This is the most essential point which must be understood, for we cannot by our own reason or strength believe in Jesus Christ nor come to him. In fact, our nature has been so corrupted that all we can do is add sin on top of sin, so that we become exceeding sinful. But that is the beauty and simplicity of the gospel, is it not? That God saw the helpless and hopeless condition which man was in, and pitied us, and so sent his Son into human flesh to rescue us from sin and death. He died so that we might live. Another passage that was considered this past week in Vacation Bible School says this, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Thus, when God grants the gift of faith unto sinful men, they are resurrected from spiritual death to spiritual life. And though they die in their bodies, those deaths become nothing more than a rest, and they never truly die at all. Man is rescued by faith in Jesus Christ, which is not a work, but a gift. And from that point on, a Christian begins to bring forth the fruit of faith. Now, as anyone knows, the fruit of a tree or plant does not first grow, followed by the plant. But the plant grows first, and then brings forth fruit. So, too, faith works. Faith grows first, that is, it is given. Then fruit begins to grow on such a living faith. That is the fruit Paul speaks of when he says that after conversion we now yield our members' servants to unrighteousness unto holiness. Now Paul says this to show the new life that a Christian has in Christ. He is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. We are renewed creatures, and as such, can no longer yield our members to serve the lusts of the flesh. Thus a Christian must often sacrifice and withhold from himself most of the pleasures and joys of this life, for they are sin. A Christian will often keep himself from the greed of the world, and in so doing cost himself much earthly gain. What these things often entail is our God showing us that to be children of Him necessarily means that we are at enmity with this world. And so a Christian will take a hard stand and not work on Sunday morning. For God has declared that a Christian should assemble together with other Christians around the Word of God. In other words, to attend church. Many make the excuse that it is not necessary to attend church services to believe. And while that is true, what does it say about one's faith? when they ignore God's clear direction to attend worship. We must remember, dear Christians, that God has given unto us a new life, a life in Him, not to have better excuses for serving ourselves. Excuses are easy and plenty, but the true fruit of faith is not to look for reasons to ignore what God says, but to follow even when there are good earthly reasons to not do so. For example, one might find that in order to save his own life,
times of persecution, he might deny the name of his Savior, thinking that he can repent later. But Jesus declares that he who denies him before men will be denied before the Father. Faith is truly trust in God, to follow his will in all things, even when it costs us on earth. During times such as these, it is important for Christians to stop for a moment and get back to the basics and remember what it is that we come here every Sunday for. It is to hear and learn of the great and wonderful works of our mighty God to undeserving sinners. It is to receive hope in a world which offers hopelessness. It is to receive comfort when the world makes us afraid. It is to receive peace when the peace of this world fails to deliver. Thus I tell you all today, dear Christians, that despite pandemics, riots, shortages, power-hungry politicians, and the like, none of those things can remove us from the love of God in Christ Jesus through faith. Christ has conquered them all. He has won the victory. He has saved you and promised you eternal life through faith. Please rise. <coughs> May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit with. Not away from thy presence, and take not thy holy spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and the Lead us to his heavenly word and doctrine, 
there to find the great and sublime truths of thy holy will. We cry for forgiveness and pardon. Turn us to him who was bruised for our iniquities and wounded for our transgressions, that by his stripes we may be cleansed, healed, and forgiven. Our souls crave for life, as thine unspeakable gift is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Feed us on this bread of immortality, that we may know the power of his resurrection. O God, grant that we may also find in him the strength we do not find in ourselves, the power to uphold us in the toil and the conflict of this earthly life, and therein to live unto thee, the grace to do thy will, so that we may be thy true and faithful servants. Nourish us by thy grace, that we may find our labor sweet and our work welcome, and all our necessities of soul and spirit supplied. Set watchmen over thy church, who shall pray without ceasing, for the prosperity of the gospel in all lands and nations. Preach thy holy word with all boldness. Prepare thy people for the time when our Lord Jesus shall return to the earth, and present unto thee in the end a holy and redeemed church. We have thought of thy loving kindness to our own country, and we thank thee for the good thou hast given us. Give strength to all the forces of righteousness in our midst, and overthrow all the powers of evil. Be to us ever our sword and shield. Be thou the helper of all our families. Implant thy word in the hearts of our children, and thy love in our parents, so that they may enjoy now and forever the fruits of holiness. Free the afflicted from their troubles, and bind them to thee, to the end that they may have abundant life, and live to serve and praise thee. O thou who seest us, who knowest our frame, and rememberest that we are best, as we go from this holy place, by thy great mercy, quicken us in faith, hope, and love, that today and every day we may live as thy children in thy presence. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. We continue with the singing of him number 369. Our light, our way, our only 
Hey! 
Life in death, life in 